up to all of you uh, in the name of uh, the ancestors for being with us. And, um, and let me just tell you, uh, I, the, the topic that I had uh, given myself was to talk about uh, the uh, African-American history, a journey of liberation. And I will talk about that, but uh, you know, we, many things have happened since we set up this calendar. And among those things has been uh, January the 6th, 2021, when we had the insurrection uh, by white supremacists at the uh, American uh, Capitol building, a building that was built by black people. Uh, many uh, African uh, people uh, who had been enslaved uh, were the basic laborers for the construction of that building, which was actually constructed in the ex very exact place where the African scientist and surveyor, uh, clockmaker Benjamin Banneker, had oh indicated God. where it should go. So, so that whole area, uh, you, we used to call it Banneker Town. And we used to call uh, Washington Banneker Town when I lived there because uh, we, we recognized that the design of Washington, D.C. had been started by LaFont, but LaFont uh, got ill, had a problem with Thomas Jefferson. He didn't finish it. And so it was left to the African, Benjamin Banneker, a Senegalese, to create, uh, to, to finish the job that had been started by LaFont. So I, I, I want to always recognize mm -hmm. that. But I also want to recognize the fact that when we look at what happened in, uh, on January the 6th, uh, that uh, as part of our own history, when we talk about the African-American journey of liberation, uh, we recognize that uh, this I insurrection was a dying gasp of, of a much too long white illness brought about by the false doctrine of white supremacy and was maintained by structures of racial intimidation and the separation of people. And we've seen this all over the world. And I know that we got some, uh, 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 got some people always at this, these lectures from South Africa. And I just want to speak to them too, because they recognize the same kinds of things, that um, these uh, structures of hegemony and these structures of separation and division these are, uh, it's almost now, since it's so historical in the world, it's almost like it is a part, a natural part of the culture of Europeans to create these symbols. And I, I will explain uh, today exactly why I believe that that is the case and why we're having these difficulties and these problems. But uh, in, in, in looking at this, in connection with uh, Martin Luther King's uh, holiday, this is a holiday because on the 15th of January is the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, but, but think about this. In the same uh, period of time as we celebrate a day of service for Martin Luther King Jr., uh, we are also discussing and talking about the assault on the U.S. Capitol by a gang of white thugs who not only led this uh, insurrection against a, uh, a, an election that they didn't like, and they didn't like the election for a number of reasons. One, the principal reason, was it was uh, one of the most multicultural uh, elections ever in the history of the United States, in, in which still the majority of white people voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, but the uh, significant amount of whites a um, uh, 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 little over 40% who voted for uh, Biden and Harris uh, in, along with the African-American vote and the uh, uh, Latino vote and the Asian-American vote uh, helped to uh, put Biden over the mark. Uh, he got certainly more than 50% that he needed. So, so, so part of what this illness is, is that uh, it's a reaction of fear. And, um, and we have to see it as that. It's a reaction of fear because, because of demographic changes. <clears throat> there are demographic changes that are happening in the United States of America, in which the is a growing population of people who are not born in Europe. And uh, there's almost no 
way for Europeans to think of a white country anymore. And that's what they are thinking of. Those thugs who were at the Capitol building, they were, they, were, they were coming there thinking that what they were about was somehow to express their uh, white nationalism. And they came, it was a very dangerous situation. But it's a situation that African-Americans have always known. We, we understood that they, they, they were, uh, there was a fear of them being shown to be crybabies, to be, to be hiding uh, uh, their own incapacity to function normally in a multicultural world. The, that's, that's, what we, that's what we saw. They, they, they were seeking a, a hegemony over other people while uh, uh, other people are seeking cooperation. They were seeking domination when other people are seeking peace. It is this feeling that burst into the Capitol building that, that was built by our black labor uh, in, in Vatican town. Uh, they clamored uh, to take back their country. This was the thing. We will take back our country. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is not white land. This is not white land. Now you have to think of all these illusions that happen in the world, because this is one of the greatest illusions. This, I, I always think that, that this is a, this is a, I, imagine this, imagine this. When, and we know this, see African people know this. And we know this because uh, when they brought us here, we saw that there were other people already here. So, so we know that this was not their land, but yet they have come to this country. And as they've come to this country, to this, to North America and to this land, they have claimed, they have tried to claim this notion that they are in fact uh, the owners of the land, but they're not the owners of the land. They created a polity and a, um, an entity on the back of what was already in existence. Somebody just move into your house and uh, take over the rooms in your house and say, well, now this house doesn't belong to you. That's, that's basically what they were doing. And that was the, that was the trick that was being played uh, when people then took this idea that in fact, it belongs to them, that this is their country. And uh, they're coming to Washington DC to take back uh, their country. Uh, w what if, if that group of people who were there had been Cherokee, had mm -hmm. been Chickasaw, uh, had been Shawnee, had been Iroquois, had been Len Lenape, Apache, Comanche, Muscogee, fighting to take back their land? What if that had happened? What would the whites have thought then if they were to say those people came up and said, look, you know what? We want to take our country back. This is our land. We want to, this is the land our ancestors uh, are buried on and died mm -hmm. for. Uh, we, we, we understand this thing that the racial construction in America was meant to allow the, uh, the legalizing of the hijacking of the native people's land and the enslavement of black people. That, that is what we have to understand. So whenever we talk about uh, America, if we don't understand this question of the construction of race, then we will never understand America. If we don't understand the enslavement of blacks and the dispossession of the native peoples, we won't understand America. America, everything is intertwined with it. All uh, values, all culture, all uh, examples of uh, whether it's uh, labor disputes, whatever you're talking about, uh, whether it is capital, uh, uh, the, the aggregation of capital by a small group of people, whatever it is, uh, you can see why Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who had uh, borne witness to this through the history of decades of fights against the doctrine of white supremacy. Uh, and I call it the doctrine of white supremacy because sometimes people say white supremacy. No, there's no white supremacy. There's only the doctrine of white supremacy. And I'll explain to you about the doctrine of white supremacy in a few minutes. But, but that's what our history is about. Our history, the journey of liberation. We know, for example, that white people are not smarter than anyone else. We know that. Uh, we, we know uh, that uh, they're not more intelligent than, uh, than we are. So, so, so what is the problem? 
Uh, we, we know that the invention of the God and the willingness to use the God to harm other people is at the core of white domination. Otherwise, there is no, there is no sense that they can dominate anything. In fact, uh, when uh, the African people encountered Europe, Europe had not developed uh, 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 very much from out of the cave. It was very clear. But when others have created guns and rockets and bombs, it's a contest that seems much more equal in its insanity. It's all insane, this notion of killing people uh, for territory or whatever purpose for wealth uh, is all insane. But when the North Koreans got a bomb, and when the Iranians got a bomb, and the Israelis got a bomb, and the Indians got a bomb, and the Pakistanis got a bomb, and South Africa had a bomb, and the, and the Russians have a bomb, and UK has a bomb, and France has a bomb, then what you are talking about, you're talking about equality of insanity. And, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and so you ask yourself the question, why is it then? that the white people who uh, stormed the Capitol felt the need to storm the Capitol of the United States of America in the name of Trump, because they knew and they felt like Trump was one of the people who supported them. That in fact, Trump not only supported them, Trump was their leader. He expressed white nationalism. He expressed this idea of white supremacy. And he said it many times in my little book, that is often, uh, that I often refer to sometimes uh, called the uh, American demagogue. The American demagogue. Uh, I wrote that book in 2017. Uh, Donald Trump and the American presidency. And so you can look that up on Amazon as well. It's called the American demagogue. Donald Trump and the American presidency. And I wanted at that time to discuss his whole notion of birthism. I mean, this idea that uh, Barack Obama was not born in the United States of America. And from that, I went into looking at his statements over the years, where he claims that because of his German blood, that he was smarter than other people. Uh, that uh, there's no such thing as German blood. There's no such thing as uh, Italian blood. There's no such thing as that. There's no, uh, there's no, that's not science. You can't talk like that. But his idea was that that made him more intelligent. So I knew right away that we were talking about a demagogue who also understood how to appeal to whites who had these notions and who may not have been as forward as he was to express them, who felt this sense that they need to express this idea of white nationalism, but he could do it and he did it. And that he understood tapped into what was laden for some uh, white people, it was a latent belief in their own sense of, uh, uh, imp uh, of power that they were better than other people. And by believing that and by accepting that, then we saw that Trump began to be considered the, the hero, the, the one who would lead them uh, back to a situation in the United States where they would be not only the, the dominant uh, population in numbers, which he, which he uh, uh, also argued about because he was very worried. You remember this. He was very worried when he became president that all the people were coming from Mexico. He said, wait a minute, we, we got to stop this thing with all these mm -hmm. people coming from Mexico. We, we, we can't do this because if all these Mexicans come in here, the country is going to be browner and browner and browner. And not mm -hmm. only that, they're going to be a doorway for other people from Africa and the Caribbean to come through Mexico and come into the country. We've got to stop. We've got to seal the border. We've got to build a wall, which is, of course, a very uh, European medieval thing to think about building walls. But that was his whole idea. That was a, maybe we build a wall to keep these people out, you see, and, uh, and so, that, so that we could, have, we could keep building a, a white nation. And when you start looking at the history of the United States, you can understand that that's the way they have used immigration. They, they, have, they don't mind opening the doors to uh, European immigration because uh, they see that as having more white people. This is uh, one of the reasons Trump said, well, we want people from Scandinavia. We don't want people from what he called these shithole nations. Uh, mm -hmm. which he meant black nations, but we want people from Scandinavia. They come from Norway, uh, if they come from Sweden, that's fine. But why do we have to have people coming from Haiti? 
Why do we have to have people coming from Nigeria, or Ghana, or Kenya, or South Africa? That kind of thing. And so, so, so we saw in him this uh, this uh, notion to want to destroy other people, to keep them out. Uh, but what would provoke one to have to this sense of action and thinking? And I think, and uh, this is one of the things that uh, certainly I not only do I think, but I know that the thing that provoked this most in uh, Donald Trump was the acceptance of this idea of race itself. That the idea of race has really corrupted everything. And uh, I, I'm I'm of the opinion that um, that uh, if you, that the people who believe this idea uh, also end up as as being uh, very foolish uh, because they believe in what I call the ra racial ladder. That is this whole um, idea that there is a hierarchy of races. That 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 that, that this is almost for them. It, they think it's almost natural that whites are at the top and blacks are at the bottom. But this is not natural. This is made by white people. They set up that system. They, 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 it's a self-appropriated system. They appropriated the top spot for them. And then they gave it glowing descriptions. When you read the literature about this and you start seeing how they uh, talked about the European and that the European had certain traits and qualities, mm -hmm. and rationality and intelligence and so on. And they go all the way down and to, from different groups to different groups to the bottom group is Africans. And it's the most unflattering to black people. It's unflattering to us, which means we didn't have anything to do with this racial ladder. We didn't construct it. We didn't build it. We didn't see uh, human beings uh, in that regard. I mean, there was difference. There have always been differences among people physically. We've looked at them. We've saw, I mean, in, in Africa itself, we have the tallest people in the world. Mm -hmm. In Africa, we also have the shortest people in the world. <clears throat> but there were no, nobody ever made no uh, uh, racial ladder or, or a ladder to say that, the, uh, that somehow the Tutsi uh, were smarter uh, than uh, uh, the Mbuti. I mean, nobody, there's no, that, that was not an African thing. Or that because a person was a, a lighter complexion than another person, that the Sudanese are darker than the South African. So therefore, the, the Sudanese are in a, as a different part of the ladder. No, no, no. It's not an African thing. It's a European thing. They created this. We, we understood human beings. And, and let me tell you something. If human beings are not actively engaged as, as self-conscious people, we are always beings for others, framed by their own ascriptions to us that they impose on us. And that's basically what has happened. So, so black people over the years, from the enslavement to now, what has happened to black people, and maybe even before, because actually to create the racial ladder, they had to already have some racial attitudes about us that were negative. I mean, you don't just come up and create a racial ladder and say, oh, black people at the bottom. No, they already, before they created a racial ladder of hierarchy that was created, uh, Europeans already had some negative attitudes about black people. Where do those negative attitudes come from? Those negative attitudes had to come from previous ideologies, whether they were religious, whether they were historical, wherever they were, they, 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 you know, they had to come from somewhere else. They were not ideas that were, uh, uh, that just came about when they created this, uh, when, when uh, uh, they, uh, Blooming Bach uh, and, uh, uh, these uh, uh, people who were uh, deep into the construction, Linnaeus, deep into the construction of race in, in, in the 17 and 1800s in Europe. When they created those racial hierarchies, they had to, they were going on something. 
They had something in their mind. Was it the, was it the Hebraic Bible? Was it the Shem, Ham, and Japhet story? I mean, I don't, I, I don't know exactly. I have some suspicions, and I've talked to Dr. Dove about this. But, but, I, but I think that they had some notion before they created it. Whites use a systemic justification that allows them always to be silent about whiteness. You, you start questioning them, what, what do you know about whiteness? What is whiteness to you? They will, uh, they will assume that they don't know anything about it because they, they assume that whiteness itself is normal. <laughs> that, that to be white is normal. That that is that there is no we have nothing. We have no issue. We we you know we are we are the model for the world. As an ideology of white supremacy, we see this whiteness justifying the taking uh, or the taking for granted of what I call the European way of doing things, the white way of doing mm -hmm. things. Whites tend to have what is only a predatory relationship with black people. And a predatory relationship with us means to take from us. It means to destroy us if they could. It means not only to take from us and to destroy us if they can, but it also means that what we have, they feel they need. This is, let me put it this way. This, as is now well known, I believe, stems from seeing blackness as an area to be mined, like a field of diamonds, of extraction mm -hmm. for the European. Both psycho-philosophically and economically. In its abjection, Africa props up the European's ego in his self-conception as the paragon of being human. So, so the perpetual pauperization of Africa making us pulpers and, and, and people in poverty, and the, the, the taking of power away from us, the disempowerment of Africans uh, through the manner in which our natural wealth continues to be exploited is a part of this whole process. So this whole process of the destruction of, of African ideas and the taking of African uh, uh, positions and the taking of African diamonds and uranium and uh, uh, cobalt and copper and, and all that, just like taking of African people, these are the fundamental problems that we have to deal with where we are dealing with this question of the racial ladder. Now, I, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, uh, King for a special reason about this because as a part of African-American history because we know, King knew, he didn't necessarily express it this way. We have later expressed it as an, as an illusion that, that this, this uh, notion of, of white racial supremacy as a doctrine uh, uh, was an illusion. And they operated as if the illusion was real. You know, and sometimes people say there's reality and then there is an illusion. But in their case, the, they took the illusion of race and racial supremacy in their mind as if that was a fact, that that was reality, you see? And they believed that, but it was a delusion. And it's often found among all the, even in the academy, in the university, you find it among uh, the, the, uh, the, the European intellectuals. And, and in fact, some black intellectuals still believe in the racial ladder. This is why we have colorism in our own communities. You know, with, who believe that if the lighter complexion you are, the closer you are to Europeans, which means on the racial ladder, the higher you are, the more intelligent, the more rational, and so on. If you're closer to uh, dark-skinned Africans, then that means you're less ir irrational, and you are more, probably more emotional, and you have more this, that, and the other. And we buy into that because that's the structure that has been uh, based. You see, white people believe this. And white people preach this to the world. And of course, the ground was established by Hinduism, by Islam, and by Christianity. This was not established in any, any African religion. You cannot find an African religion that created these racial ladders like that. This is only found in the European and the Hindu and the Hebraic and the 
uh, Islamic uh, traditions, the Arab traditions. Yeah. Even today, white evangelicals. These are supposed to be the, the most fanatical Christians in mm -hmm. the Christian church. The most fanatical Christians in the Christian church approve of the doctrine of white supremacy as a goal. And that's why they support Trump. Why do you think they support Trump? They see in Trump the Jesus that that was in prayer at the at, at Gethsemane. In the picture that y'all all, some of you grew up with in your churches, you know, the picture of the white Jesus praying at Gethsemane. <laughs> they see that. They they see the, the image of this um, Scandinavian Jesus as as the, the perfect example, the normal example, the only example of what is ethical, what is moral, what is correct, what is right, what is just, you see? And so the radicalization by the media, and I always say that the media didn't create the far right because it's always mm -hmm. existed in this country. African American people know that it's always existed, this radicalization. Uh, and, uh, you know, if those of you who've seen uh, the, the thing about uh, the social dilemma, the, this, uh, uh, it's a movie, actually, a documentary called Social Dilemma. And, and I've seen it. It's a very powerful uh, mm -hmm. discussion of how uh, the media controls uh, what we think, what, what we put on as a priority of our thinking for the day, our discussions for the day, all these things. But what, what, we, what we understand by that is that they know what they, they're creating and they know how they created Trump. Mm. And, but Trump, once he was created by the media, tapped into the white lies of superiority and the feeling that whites were losing the demographic battle of the country. Too many brown and black people. Mm -hmm. You gotta lock up black men you got to keep out the immigrants Kill. when they are the children themselves. The whites are children of immigrants. They, they, they are, they, their granddaddies and grandmothers were immigrants mm -hmm. for the most part. And most of them haven't been here as long as the Africans. If you start looking at how long, how many generations Africans have been in this country and look at uh, how many generations Trump family has been in this country, you, you'd be surprised. He's, he's been, what, two generations? Mm -hmm. My family goes back in Georgia six or seven generations. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the, here's the thing. We, we, we need to also continue to get our news. I tell people from, from as the news sources, the ones that we consider to be legitimate, some of them, sometimes you have to balance between different ones. That's why I used to love to see Russia today or Al Jazeera, then of course you know what they did was they basically mm -hmm. uh, prevented those uh, services from serving in the United States. So you, exactly. you, you, it's hard to see Al Jazeera or hard to see Russia today, you see? Because they, America shut it down. And they, they shut down, you, you, you want you to hear another voice. There are always other voices, you see? So what they do, they feed you this algorithm the, uh, so that you, and particularly if you own social media, if you own a lot of social media, Twitter, uh, what's the uh, Facebook, Instagram, Facebook. there's so much stupidity and so many yeah. lies that are being told by all kinds of people. Anybody, you can wake up in the morning and put your whole stuff right there. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can't, but you, you, you've got to figure out as much as you can. And we have to do this. And we've had to do this. King understood this. You had to understand what is the real core of America. I heard Michael Court say today, he said, some people said when the um, uh, white people uh, uh, marched and, and demonstrated and broke into the Capitol building that they, oh, this ain't America. This is not America. This is America. That's what it is. That's mm -hmm. what it's been for black people from the very beginning. So, and let me tell you, we're planning to have a seminar about this in February, early February, at the Temple University in the Department of Africology to deal with this issue. Because if you go back in America's history, you see one insurrection, one riot after another. another. This is what America is about. 
And one of the first ones was 1874 in New Orleans. And you know what you can do? And you can, you can all do it. I, I do it from time to time. If, if there's a discussion, well, what about insurrection? It's a Google insurrection. Oh, there's the insurrection in New Orleans. What happened? Thousands of white people, once black people were elected uh, to uh, mm -hmm. state houses, marched in with their guns and everything to try to take over the state house from the people who had been elected. What happened in Wilmington, uh, uh, North Carolina in 1898? Well, uh, 2,000 white people marched in, took over the government of Wilmington, North Carolina from the black people and some of the liberal whites who had been elected, took it over, ran them out of town and put their own people in. This is America. What are you talking about? But you know what happens in America? We do not discuss, we do not deal with questions in America about, um, uh, what should I say? We don't deal with the question in America that, uh, that uh, gives us information about what's going on in history. And a lot of people don't have a historical understanding. And I've, I've found that... Uh, that uh, that not only it's not just a white evangelicals, it's a lot of us. A lot of us don't have an understanding, and our educational system is poor and bad. We don't understand. There's no there's nowhere you can go, no school you can go to that would give you the history of insurrections in America, the history mm -hmm. of American massacres against the native peoples, or the history of American riots against uh, African people, and so forth. Uh, and there are scores of them. There's a your whole course, you can teach a whole course on white mobs attacking black people, burning down our houses, destroying our industrial uh, and capital bases. I mean, all that stuff is in, it's in the literature. And so when I, when I wrote my book, uh, um, African American History, A Journey of Liberation, that's what I was looking at. I was looking at, you know what? We nobody's told this history, and nobody can tell it like us. And you really, you can only tell it correctly if you're an Afrocentrist. Because if you're not an Afrocentrist, and you read and study all the history that has been written by Europeans, you will be telling a European history. You have to put yourself in the mind set that look. I'm looking at this from the standpoint of African people as being actors in history. So we have always been the point soldiers for our freedom. Our community defined freedom because we were held in bondage. And we knew freedom in Africa and taught that in the words of our greatest men and women that, that we had to be freedom. Uh, we had to go look for freedom. Uh, and so when you start talking about America, freedom, and freedom in America, you're talking about black people. Well, white mm -hmm. people were not talking about freedom. What are they free from? <laughs> they not talking about freedom. They did talk about liberty, but those are a whole different question having to do with capitalism and stuff. But that's a different thing. But our, our concern and our interest was always freedom. And, and if you look, we understood that Africa is free of that, this so-called vice that has existed with this racial ladder, with this isfet, as we would say in the ancient Kemetic language, isfet, I-S-F-E-T, isfet, meaning evil. You know, it's, it's a bad thing. This is the isfet, the kemet, that's what they said. What we were looking for, we were looking for ma'at, M-A-A-T. We were looking for ma'at. We were looking for that which was uh, truth and, and justice and righteousness, you see? Uh, so where do we go from here in our history? We've always been uh, the, the people out front trying to define freedom. Uh, our best role has been as fighters for freedom. And I always say like Haki Madabudi and Sonia Sanchez and Nikki Giovanni and Maya Angelou and Gwendolyn uh, Brooks, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have been great poets and we have achieved many things in every realm of life. We have been scientists uh, since Banneker and since Onesimus. We've been poets and writers since Phyllis Wheatley um, who, who, who we, we call Binta, coming from Senegal. Uh, we've had politicians mm -hmm. like Adam Clayton Powell, 
who've spoken up well. We have athletes like Jackie Robinson and Carl Lewis and Muhammad Ali, the Williams sisters and so on. Yeah, okay. Judges like Thurgood Marshall and educators Marshall. like Benjamin Mays. But, but our greatest, most uh, uh, accomplished uh, people have always been those people who've been fighting for freedom. I'm telling you, Sojourner Truth, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Harriet Tubman, Nat Turner, mm -hmm. Denmark Vesey, right. Du Bois, Cecil B. Moore, Adelaide Sanford, Diane Nash, and then local people. I put Cecil B. Moore in there because Philadelphia mm -hmm. knows him. If you talk about Philadelphia, they say, oh, wow. We, we know him because he fought in the 60s for freedom. Or even local people like Floyd Rose in Valdosta, Georgia, or when he was in Toledo, Ohio. You know, you almost have some of these people who just grew up in their, in a sort of organic way in their communities. They have hundreds and thousands of these people throughout the United okay. States. Every community, you know them. Every community, you know an African woman or an African man who stands up and tells the truth. Sure, because yeah. we, that is who we are. That's a part of our, our, uh, uh, part of our moral character. We articulate the most desperate cause for light in a room full of darkness. We extend the runway for others to follow to their freedom. That, that's who we are. That's our character. And this legacy, though, is not a heroic one in the sense that there's one individual. There's no cult here. This is about movement. This is about, and a movement is not one person. One person can't do this. It mm. is a comprehensive response to systemic racism and violence against Black people. That's what gives us this movement. It's a collective thing. It's almost like the Kwanzaa principle, you see? It, it's all collective. This, this is not the, a time uh, or a place for hero worship, but for a collective mm -hmm. sense of we are not going to permit this to happen to us. That's mm -hmm. And so when we have these individuals like uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, we, we see him as the articulator, the orator, of the feelings of a mass of people, many of whose names we don't know. The four little women, oh. girls who were bombed at that church in Birmingham. Birmingham. The people who were uh, hosed down with water in Birmingham. The people who marched in every city after his death. We, we don't, I'm telling you, we don't know their names. But it's almost like how we sometimes we, we forget because we recognize the leader. I mean, when King was in Montgomery, Alabama, and we saw him as the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott movement, you know what we did know? That the 26-year-old King was defended in court by the 25-year-old Fred Gray. An attorney just out of school at Case Western Law in Cleveland, and the 25-year-old Fred Gray, for whom there's a, a library and museum at Tuskegee in that area, was just as brilliant as King, but he was not the leader of that movement because the leader of that movement was an orator, and very few orators have been as incredibly brilliant as Martin Luther King Jr. So, so when we when we look at King and then we look at the sisters who were before Rosa Parks, mm. then we say, wait a minute, it's just not King. It's not just Rosa Parks. There's so many people who are so involved people. in this process. Yeah. And that is the way our history is. Ours is a collective community exper experiencing, uh, I always say experiencing um, a, a, an enormity of 400 years worth of ignorance based on the idea that white skin is an advantage. Today, my, my commitment in King's name 
is to continue to address the, the, the weakness uh, that uh, exists in European culture to show in every sector that people of all complexions and all creeds and all backgrounds have equal talents and abilities uh, for science, art, ethics, political leadership and courage. And the anthem of the African-American community, the, the very anthem of our community has always been uh, an anthem of unity and an anthem that was based fundamentally on the, on the idea that progress can be made, but can only be made by those people who are willing to defend it and to fight for it. So I salute you in the name of the ancestors. I thank you all for coming to this lecture and I appreciate you uh, and hope that you uh, will be with us again on January the 31st.